Hello and welcome to IOHR TV. My name is Trish Lynch. Today I'm with Ambassador Stephen Rapp, an American lawyer who has been seeking justice for the victims of war crimes worldwide throughout his entire career. As an international prosecutor, he has worked on conflicts and human rights violations which have marked history from the Rwanda genocide to Sierra Leone and Syria. Mr. Rapp was also appointed as US Ambassador at Large for War Crimes issued by the Obama administration in 2009. Ambassador Rapp, thank you for joining us. Good to have you with us. Good to be with you, Trish. Now, in 2001, you joined the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. You led the prosecution against the leaders of two media outlets, and you achieved the very first conviction in history for the crime of direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Tell me more, if you would, about those two media outlets. How do they incite genocide? And just how important was that landmark conviction for international justice? Well, it was extremely important to, uh, to, to hold these uh, in, in organizations and their leadership uh, to account because uh, uh, they communicated messages through the media, uh, which, which were a, a form of almost direct uh, orders and, and communication and, uh, uh, and, and command uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the genocide, for the murder of 800,000 men, women, and children over the course of a period of only 100 days. Uh, the genocide in Rwanda occurred in over 200 communes, indeed in every commune that was under the control of the interim government. And I think it was in the nature of the fact that the media was there encouraging people to join in the killing uh, you know, arguing t with them, pressing them, and essentially saying, if you don't kill these people, they'll kill you. And it was that messaging that made it possible for the, for the genocide to be so complete and so comprehensive. And it was, uh, it was certainly one of the more challenging things that I ever did because we had to show what the media had done. There was a lot of reporting about it, but uh, uh, there, there weren't original uh, tapes, for instance, of the broadcast made by the station itself. You had to find people who had recorded those broadcasts, some of them victims themselves, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and show that the communication uh, was indeed something that wasn't allowed under international law. And of course, a lot of times we're talking about the importance of free expression. But this is a situation where it went beyond expression to actually calling for, for violent action. And even though we have an international human rights law, like under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 19 about free expression, we also have Article 20, that, that uh, communication which directly encourages hatred and violence uh, can be and, and should be prescribed. And of course, this is the most extreme example of that, the incitement to, uh, to commit genocide. Uh, the most challenging thing was to show that these individuals were in control of the station, in control of the newspaper uh, at the time uh, that the killings occurred, because it had to be direct. And, and we were able to succeed and, and, uh, and win the first convictions uh, in the history of the world, frankly. Uh, Today, there's a lot of awareness about media freedom, but there's not much discussion, there's not much conversation about the violations committed by the media system and the lack of ethics. Do you think this is a conversation that's long overdue that we need to be having? I think it's important uh, for, for, for media to, uh, you know, maintain uh, its, its credibility. And, you know, I'm from the United States of America. We have the First Amendment, uh, very robust protection uh, to the media, very difficult in America even to, even to sue for libel, for instance, unless you can show, if you're a public figure, unless you can show actual malice. And uh, I tend to be, be a believer in, in, in that kind of approach. Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, those who are unhappy about the media, and that includes almost everybody in power, mm -hmm. you know, who is or appropriately criticized, uh, questions raised about the inconsistency between what they're promising and what they're delivering, and certainly questions raising about uh, their abuses and violations of law and those kinds of things. Uh, they uh, increasingly want to demonize the media and talk about fake news when it's actually what they're angry about is truthful news, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and I think that uh, it's then necessary for the media to make sure that when a mistake is made, that it's promptly corrected. Uh, when, when there are abuses, when there are people within the media that are receiving money uh, you know, for, for certain reports, et cetera, uh, that, there are, that there are actions and ethical proceedings that are done uh, within, within the profession. Uh, and and uh, if that's done right and effectively, I think that generally resolves the issue. I'm not a favor of, of governments establishing boards uh, you know, to regulate media. Uh, when it comes to 
broadcasts. Uh, certainly there are licensing requirements that can be out there and, and certain things in terms of, uh, of, of speech that could be, could be damaging that can be appropriately regulated and licensed. But I think that that's, uh, uh, that's something on which the government needs to exercise a light hand and, and to really call on the journalists themselves to, 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 uh, uh, to, to take care of their own profession except in those extreme cases like I prosecuted in Rwanda. Today there are many journalists who do a professional job, independent, critical journalists who tell the truth, but they find themselves behind bars accused of being terrorists. Now I know you've recently worked on a report for the Clooney Foundation monitoring the trial of Kanzu Pisk. What can you tell us more about that particular case? It's an example of many that are happening in, in Turkey and of course uh, many of those that have been prosecuted have faced even worse consequences than she did. Uh, she, uh, uh, she uh, writing for, a, uh, for an online uh, newspaper, uh, reported on the assignment of a new prosecutor to the, to the students uh, at Bosphorus University who had, had conducted a very clever protest against President uh, Erdogan's uh, incursion, invasion into, into Turkey, in, into Afrin. And they were um, appropriately in Turkey handing out Turkish delights, calling them Afrin delights, etc. And of course this outraged the government. Uh, they were immediately arrested, detained for a long period, uh, and, and were going to face trial. And on the eve of trial they assigned a new prosecutor, and in fact it's a prosecutor that's uh, been active in politics and has even had comments upon the the National Party, which represents substantial numbers of the Kurdish community, peaceful party, not a PKK party, etc., but who'd actually called that party simply because it was Kurdish, uh, essentially an organ of a terrorist organization. And she pointed out that he was assigned and and uh, and, and made reference uh, to that to to that background. Uh, for that, she was charged uh, with uh, targeting an individual for terrorist attack. And now the problem with that is, one, as she was merely reporting on a fact, mm -hmm. a fact that had been actually reported in, in print papers, in major establishment papers, and, uh, and, and two, if you're going to charge someone for doing targeting like that, um, it's, it's, you need specific intent. Just They didn't have that proof. Now they put her on trial even after the, the main prosecutor had dropped the case, even after the time had, had expired normally to pursue a case, and, and brought it back under the, un, under the terrorism law. It was a public trial. She was given time to prepare. The case was adjourned a couple times. Mm -hmm. but, but basically, every argument that was made was respectfully knocked down, even the arguments that were absolutely uh, uh, clear un, under the law. And she's convicted uh, without uh, really any showing, no showing of specific intent. And indeed, one of the reasons the case was delayed then and brought back, they said, is because there were new facts. Well, there were no new facts presented uh, in, in, in the case. Uh, now, in the end, she got a 10-month sentence that was suspended if she gave up her right of appeal and went under supervision of all of her broadcasts or all of her uh, online uh, uh, publications for the next five years. So one sees in that, as was indicated by the rapporteur of the OSCE on press freedom, uh, an example of what's really intended here is, is to put these individuals under tighter regulation, but certainly intimidate them with the prospect that if they don't toe the line, uh, they're going to be seeing the inside of a very unpleasant jail. In terms of, of following the, the burden of proof, in terms of providing reasoned decisions for, for, uh, uh, for uh, reason, uh, logic and, and, uh, and explanation for, uh, for decisions made by the court, it was lacking. And for that reason, it was, it was a trial that, in my view, deserved a D, you know, on an A, B, C, D, F scale. Tell me more about trial monitoring. How does it actually work? And how does it help those who've been wrongly convicted? In this particular case, uh, we had uh, uh, teams of young people who went to, to, that were associated with the law school, Columbia Law School in New York, and, and, uh, uh, and who, who spoke the language, who were able to go uh, to trial and, and follow it, uh, obtain uh, transcripts if there were transcripts, or provide notes of what happened each day in court. Rare, and so I've got the benefit of of, of, of the record in, in translation and of everything that happened in court, everything on the charge sheet, and I can be, you know, have questions answered in terms of any part of the proceeding. 
and then able to, to, to look at the various factors which are objective ones in terms of indication of political motivation and, uh, and, and, and the sort of expectations of, of, of how a trial should take place, including those that are contained in international human rights law. Uh, in, in part three of the ICCPR, the sort of guarantees that an individual should have, and, uh, and, 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 by, and then be able to evaluate that trial and publish on it. By doing that, we're hoping that in the case of, of regimes in which even though there's a narrowing of democratic space and restriction, particularly on the press, which makes democracy difficult, you still have in Turkey, as we saw in the, in the rerun Istanbul election, you know, a, a, a possibility of change. In 2005, you were one of the chief prosecutors uh, for Sierra Leone, another landmark conviction mm -hmm. that you ratified. The conviction this time was for crimes of recruiting and using child soldiers. Tell me how this landmark conviction has paved the way for children's rights in conflict zones around the world. It was the first time that this had been done, and, and I understand under the International Criminal Court it's now in their statute, uh, uh, but our crimes occurred before the ICC came into being in 2002. Uh, this was uh, in the, the brutal civil war uh, in, in Sierra Leone and West Africa that had followed the earlier conflict in Liberia. Uh, we allege that President Charles Taylor of Liberia, who led an armed group that invaded uh, Liberia at the end of 1989, uh, was in fact responsible largely for what was happening in nearby Sierra Leone later in the 1990s. But uh, unlike other situations where we have ethnic or political uh, motivation, religious motivation for crimes, it's here it was frankly the leadership uh, uh, wanting to gain power, gain control of natural resources, gain the diamonds, etc. They didn't have much of a political program. It was very hard to convince uh, adults <laughs> to support them. And so their, their way of fighting the conflict was to march into a village and commit horrible, brutal acts. I mean, burn, it, be, burn people alive, uh, um, you know, rape the women, uh, uh, drag men uh, uh, to a stump and, and chop off their hand. You know, you're either dead or you join us. Mm -hmm. you, you dig diamonds as a, if you're older and able-bodied. If you're younger, we'll make you a soldier. And then they would take these, these young people, uh, boys generally, but also girls, uh, you know, dope them up in, uh, you know, with the crack cocaine mixed with, with gunpowder, methamphetamine, etc., and uh, convince them that they were a Rambo, give them a machine gun uh, that was almost taller and longer than they were, and, um, and then send them out to commit horribly brutal acts, sometimes against their own families and, and communities, and in the process cutting the sort of tie or the place that they might have to go back to. And, and then use those people to march into the next village and to commit the same kind of act until the whole country was sort of terrorized into submission. I mean, uh, Taylor could never gain actual power in, 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 in Liberia through this sort of method. He couldn't take the capital city, but then he ran for president and his slogan became, he killed my ma, he killed my pa, I'll vote for him. Because basically this kind of horror would continue unless you gave him power. And of course it gains power and then he uses the organs of the state to do the same thing. And even then the, the justice expectation is, well, we can't really prosecute somebody who was 12 years old for doing it to you. We need, and they say, why not? <laughs> you know, no, we need to prosecute the person who sent them. And then we have to show the connection between the person that sent them and, and, and their act, which is sometimes very difficult in the absence of documents. And certainly we see in the ICC that they've lost a number of cases against senior leadership because they can't show that linkage. What we hope to do in the criminal law is by these prosecutions send a message uh, uh, to, to leaders and others that might use this tool uh, that there are consequences and that uh, and those consequences uh, will follow them for the rest of their lives and there's the possibility of their prosecution for as long as they live. In 2009 you were appointed ambassador at large for war crimes issues yes. by Obama. Yes. Your role entailed formulating US policies in response to atrocities and to war crimes. Can you tell us a bit more about that particular role? This particular post was created during the Clinton administration uh, uh, when these tribunals began to be established in the post-Cold War period. Of course, the tradition that we're following is that of Nuremberg and the ways in which the Nazi leaders uh, were held to account for the mass 
atrocities and other violations that were committed during World War II. Uh, but during the Cold War, it was impossible to do that, even though some major crimes were being committed. But at the end of the Cold War, and particularly when we had the horrors in the former Yugoslavia, and when we had the genocide in Rwanda, the, the Security Council established uh, courts um, in, in those two cases, and then worked uh, to establish uh, hybrid or mixed courts in, for Sierra Leone and Cambodia and, and, and other places uh, to, uh, uh, to apply the law of war crimes against senior leaders, apply the law of crimes against humanity, which are basically massive crimes against the civilian population, and to use the Genocide Convention that only came to us after World War II uh, that had made it a crime to destroy an ethnic or religious or, or racial group in, in whole or significant part. So the idea, at least when this job was established, was the U.S., which was supporting these tribunals, would, uh, would uh, establish an office that would really coordinate our diplomacy and all our tools that we have in order to make these tribunals work. And, uh, and, and that was the situation with the office. I was the fourth ambassador at large. There had been two during the Bush administration, the president of, of, of Bush, uh, uh, George W. Bush, between 2001 and 2009. So it was a bipartisan thing. And so, uh, but when I got in in 2009, we had major challenges where the Yugoslavia Tribunal still didn't have all of its fugitives. There was Mladic, the general inc accused of being the leader of the Srebrenica massacre occurred in 1995. 2009, he was under indictment for 14 years, still on the run. We worked very hard with the prosecutor, with other countries, with then Serbian authorities, uh, with the EU that, that was saying to Serbia, you can't get into the EU unless you cooperate with the ICTY, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, in order to make it possible for him finally to be located and arrested and transferred to the court in May of 2011. Uh, lots of situations like that, plus, of course, uh, places in the world that didn't have an international court that was operating and where crimes were being committed. Uh, uh, places in, 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 in Africa, in, in Congo, with major uh, warlords that were fighting, particularly in the East, and, uh, and committing mass rape. And then, of course, in 2011, with the Arab Spring and, and all of the, uh, all that followed from that, we had the uh, um, issue of accountability in places like Syria, or later uh, accountability for the crimes of, of ISIS. Uh, and, uh, and there wasn't an international court for that either. And so the focus uh, then became, let's make sure that we can document this crime as, as effectively as we can. I mean, I engaged, uh, developed a relationship with Caesar, the defecting Syrian military photographer, worked to make sure that he was protected in a third country, worked to Tell make sure that his information got to, to national prosecutors yeah. who might have jurisdiction, but continued to do, and, and in Myanmar, South Sudan, and in other places, uh, and, and coming to Geneva then became a much more important thing because we couldn't go to The Hague for those crimes because the ICC didn't have jurisdiction and the Security Council wouldn't send them the case. We would go to Geneva where we could get inquiry commissions established and begin at least to develop the facts. I know you've been working hard to collect mm -hmm. enough evidence, enough documentation to bring the first case against the Assad regime mm -hmm. for the detention, the torture and the murder of thousands and thousands of its people. Do you think that Assad will ever be prosecuted? I think if, if Assad lives long enough, I think he will be. Uh, 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 keep in mind that uh, uh, at the moment we're limited to, to what state national systems can do. And there's a case that will begin uh, soon in Koblenz, Germany, uh, uh, against uh, two senior officials that were involved in, in torturing individuals in a general intelligence uh, detention facility in Damascus. and. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, some of the victims of the people that they tortured or allegedly tortured uh, were in the Caesar photos and have been identified. And so uh, that's an example, and the leading defendant was a colonel. Uh, and so there is the possibility, and there are other cases that are out there, including in France and Germany, where top officials of the Assad regime, including uh, 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 Ali Mamluk, head of the National Security Bureau, or uh, Jamil Hassan, head of the notorious Air Force Intelligence that ran the very nasty facility at uh, Juwia in Damascus. Uh, those individuals are now under international arrest warrants issued by Germany and France. And so uh, we, we're sending a signal, certainly to those top officials within the regime, that they'll face consequences and uh, they may hope to win the conflict 
conflict, but they're never going to go be able to go visit their money in the West or family members or others uh, without the risk of, of, of arrest. Um, under international law as recognized by the International Court of Justice, national ca courts can't prosecute a sitting head of state of a foreign country. That can only be done by an international court. And the route to an international court has been blocked by the Russian veto and the Security Council. And so uh, you know, going after Assad himself while he's in power mm -hmm. is, is, is challenging. But uh, we'll continue. The, the evidence has been built. Uh, we have obviously the Caesar photos, uh, 55,000 photos of people tortured to death in, in government custody. Uh, President Assad says it's fake news. No, it's not fake news. It's been verified by the FBI, by the uh, uh, Koblenz and Freiburg uh, uh, Forensic Institutes in Germany. The, the metadata is all there. It's not been one pixel moved on those photos. There are others documentation. I'm, I'm uh, chair of the board of, 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 a, of an NGO called CJA, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. We've worked with Syrians to bring out 800,000 pages of regime documents that were uh, abandoned by the regime at various times during the Civil War when they lost control of, of, of certain cities. And, uh, and those are stamped and signed and sealed in, in sequential order and, and, uh, and, and essentially uh, self-proving as official documents. And, and they show the whole plan of this regime, which would basically faced hundreds of thousands of people in the street decided they would just uh, arrest all those people and torture them to death, <laughs> etc. And, and that, or, or torture them into such a point that uh, they, would, they would never consider opposing the regime again and would be an example to others. So uh, there was a very clear strategy of, uh, of, of, of immense war crimes, which of course included the ways in which the conflict itself was fought, not as required under international humanitarian law by attacking military targets, mm -hmm. but by attacking civilians, including humanitarian workers, including medical facilities and hospitals, and then the use of, of, of poison gas in order to uh, uh, penetrate below the surface and get to people that are, that are hiding uh, underground and in, in shelter. We've now got better evidence than we had in Sierra Leone or we had in the Rwanda Tribunal, as good in, as evidence as, uh, as they had at Nuremberg uh, to convict these guys. And, uh, and we're finding courts uh, to, to hear that evidence that have jurisdiction um, for various reasons uh, for these crimes and, uh, and, and building it for the day that, that, uh, uh, that there can be a, a court that can hold those individuals to responsible. Now you've spoken of the importance of collecting enough evidence, mm -hmm. enough documentation, and I know you've just said that you have an overwhelming amount of documentation that points towards war crimes in Syria. I think you said it was in excess of what you had for Bosnia and Rwanda together. How important is it for the international community to collect this documentation in the right way? It's extremely important to, to collect the documentation in the right way when the crimes are committed. And, and we've certainly seen in the International Criminal Court, in, in cases in which they've had jurisdiction by reason of the country sending the case to the ICC or the Security Council sending it, or the prosecutor opening it under their, under their statute, where they've lost, as in the Kenya cases, or as in the Bemba case out of the Central African Republic, uh, or even though it's on appeal in, in Cote d'Ivoire involving, involving former President Bagbo. And, um, and, and there, in those cases, there was no question about the crime, uh, and so the crimes have been committed, but the question is, were these top-level individuals responsible? And, and that's where the cases uh, failed. And, and so that's why it's so important to have that documentation. I was a national prosecutor before I came to the international level, and I used to always believe you needed about twice the evidence you thought was reasonable. I mean, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and, uh, and some witnesses uh, may not be available, and, uh, and, and, and some contradictions may appear in the testimony of even people that are trying to tell the truth, and, and, and you think are, and they may not be fully believed. One of my friends has said, you know, this is really the king and the queen of, of, of evidence is, is having uh, documents that can be proved up uh, with, with the verified signatures of the key officials, etc. And so you can see all of that. And, and that was, of course, the secret of, of Nuremberg. It wasn't the testimony, which was there, was, a, there was a little bit of testimony at Nuremberg, but it was largely a, a document case. It's Stephen Rapp, we thank you for your time. Sure. We thank you for sharing your expertise yes, with we'll us here to today. Do that. Okay. Thank you. Great. And thank you at home and those of you who are watching virtually for joining us for another episode of IOHR TV. From myself, Trish Lynch, and the entire team here in Geneva, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.